Hello, welcome to this pivotal gathering, a convergence of hearts and minds fueled by shared vision, justice for Palestine. Friends, comrades, esteemed guests, and fellow advocates, welcome to today's talk event where we will delve into boycott, divest, and sanction the BDS movement, a powerful force in uh, advocating for Palestinian rights. In light of the recent Israeli aggression on, Palestine, on Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, and seeing how political institutions have failed the people of Gaza in stopping the continuous massacres, there is an urgency for people to take action. BDF, B BDS serves as a non-violent strategy to support Palestinian rights and promote justice. So, in this session, we will discuss the importance of boycotting, divesting, and sanctioning Israel as a means of exerting pressure. We will explore what BDS entails in practical terms, including its goals, methods, and the impact it seeks to achieve. Let me uh, introduce our esteemed guests. Uh, we welcome Dr. Mustafa Barghouti. Dr. Mustafa is a Palestinian physician, activist, a politician. He serves as the General Secretary of the Palestinian National Initiative, also known as Al Mubadara. Dr. Barghouti has been a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council since 2006 and is also a member of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO Central Council. Uh, Dr. Barghouti serves as the serves uh, served as the ministry a minister of the information of information in, in the Palestinian Unity Government in 2007, and he's also known for his work in defending human rights and internal democracy. He is the founder and chair of the Palestinian Medical Relief Society (PMRS). Next, I introduce Muzna Shhadi. Shabi. Sh Shabi? Yes. Okay, sorry. I don't know. She knows better. Shabi. <laughs> uh, okay, Shabi, sorry. Uh, she is um, a development and communications expert at the Arabic Center for Research and Policy Studies. She studied the pa Palestinian public diplomacy and media for her master's degree and, uh, from Birzeit University in Palestine and London School of Economics. During the Second Intifada, she was part of the media monitoring group ensuring that Palestinian story is told in an accurate and humanitarian, humanizing way in Western media outlets. She was also a communications advisor for, for Palestinian Liberation Organization, drafting policy papers, fact sheets, and opinion articles on the question of Palestine. Next, I'm introducing Khaled. Khaled is a Palestinian Jewish youth organizer. He's a journalist and an educator. He works on anti-discrimination and BDS campaigns in addition to raising awareness on Palestine and connecting the Palestinian struggle to local and international struggles for liberation and justice. Khaled studies sociology and anthropology. Next, I'm introducing, last but not least, Nadia Tannous. Nadia is a passionate community organizer and writer. Born and raised in the Bay Area with the focus on political education, movement, movement building and returning land to the people and people returning to the land. Nadia is a longtime organizer with the Palestinian Youth Movement and currently serves as the Deputy Director of Honor the Earth, an indigenous-led environment justice organization tackling climate disaster and its root cause of settler colonialism, racial capitalism, militarism, and imperialism. She is also a member of the Art Against Imper Imper Imprisonment Coalition and is ex uh, excited about her newest Oakland mural project, Sumud, Resistance Until Liber Liberation. Welcome, everyone, and uh, let's start with this uh, conversation. 
Um, so first, um, uh, so, oh, I have to uh, also tell our audience that uh, Dr. Mustafa ha is in China now, and it is now past midnight in his time. So we will be asking him first um, a few questions, and then he will have to leave us uh, halfway through because, you know, um, it, the time difference is a bit too harsh for him. Okay, so uh, since uh, the BDS has started in 2005, um, what kind of changes have we seen on the ground in Palestine? Um, and what has changed now with um, the global movement and uh, the, you know, people against the genocide in Gaza, Dr. Mustafa? Well, as a matter of fact, I think the first beginning of boycott divestment sanctions started even earlier in 2002 with the anti-apartheid uh, conference that took place in South Africa at the time. And uh, <clears throat> since then, we have seen a, a very dramatic growth of the uh, boycott divestment sanctions campaign and movement worldwide. Uh, but uh, the good thing about it is that it has a local structure, a local organization, which includes includes hundreds of Palestinian civil society organizations, uh, but also it is spread worldwide in a decentralized manner. Uh, in my opinion, the BDS has been growing dramatically, uh, especially since the Second Intifada. And uh, just before the last uh, terrible genocide war in Gaza, I think it reached a point where it was causing serious harm to the Israeli uh, occupation government. Our estimates were that uh, BDS was costing Israel approximately $15 billion a year, uh, which is a very dramatic uh, number. Uh, but the more important thing that it was causing Israel a lot of moral uh, loss uh, since it uh, was really directing the attention of people to the terrible injustice that uh, Israel is practicing against Palestinian people. The value of BDS was also growing, uh, being an instrument, a way uh, that allows <clears throat> international solidarity with Palestine to transform and translate into, sorry, into an effective uh, material effect. Like, I mean, maybe Israel doesn't care about demonstrations, doesn't care about statements, but when this solidarity movement transforms into a material effect of causing boycott of Israel, then of course it, it makes it very serious. More important, I think also BDS has become an instrument, a tool, which Palestinians in the diaspora can use to be participant in the Palestinian struggle. Because again, <coughs> their efforts could be transformed and translated into a material participation in the struggle of the Palestinian people against the oppression and the apartheid. Since the beginning of the attack on Gaza, and since this terrible three war crimes started in Gaza, the genocide, the collective punishment, as well as the ethnic cleansing, there has been a dramatic jump in the activities of boycott divestment sanctions. And uh, I do believe that it has expanded dramatically. We still don't have a particular estimate of uh, how much this is costing Israel. But we know that the impact is huge, and the impact is coming not only from the activities of the BDS, but also from the fact that so many companies worldwide are finding it unacceptable or not worth, uh, not, not worth uh, investing in Israel. Uh, one very good example of that is the huge uh, divestment that uh, that happened with Intel, which decided to cancel a very big investment in Israel. Maybe not because they believe in BDS, but because they see that the uh, atmosphere in Israel is not going to bring them the profit they want, which is a very important impact. I mean, it's BDS can function in two ways. First way is that people boycott consciously the Israeli company, the Israeli settlement activities, etc. But also, uh, it, uh, the, the BDS itself uh, identifies Israel as a pariah state, and that's why people start to be worried about investing in it. 
Uh, I do believe that now we have a fantastic new instrument which will help uh, uh, improve and even increase the value and the, the, the possibility of expansion of BDS, uh, specifically because of the most recent uh, decision of the International Court of Justice. Uh, this resolution, in my opinion, provides the very important material base for justifying the utmost possible amount of boycott divestment sanctions. I think it should be used widely, as we did use before the other ICG uh, decision about the uh, illegal apartheid wall. I think this, this even uh, most recent opinion of the ICG is even more powerful because it classifies all the Israeli presence in the occupied Palestinian territories as, as illegal, it, it identifies Israeli policy as racist and as a system of apartheid. And uh, also it calls on all countries of the world and on all people of the world to do whatever they can to end the illegal Israeli presence, including, of course, settlements, and to reverse the Israeli acts, including the annexation of Jerusalem, as well as certain parts of the West Bank. It's a very important resolution, which, in my opinion, will give a very serious push to the BDS movement. One uh, other uh, point I want to mention is that <clears throat> the boycott now is affecting not only Israel, but also companies that support Israel, and specifically some American companies, like Starbucks, like uh, McDonald's, like uh, Coca-Cola and others. And that is having a very serious effect. I, I don't have the figures now, but I think Starbucks announced that they have lost billions of dollars because of this boycott campaign, which is why, which is widely respected in many Arab countries as well as many countries in the world. And in the light of the fact that many Arab governments are failing to show the necessary uh, solidarity with the Palestinian people, I think the peoples of these countries are practicing this solidarity through this huge boycott campaign against many American companies and not just uh, Israeli companies. It is, uh, I want to finish here also by mentioning that uh, it is very important that boycott does not only include products and companies and uh, projects, but it is very important to enhance the cultural and sport uh, boycott. Uh, this was very effective in the case of South Africa uh, in the case of anti-apartheid movement. And I do believe that uh, this, this aspect of the boycott, uh, uh, including art, culture, sport, is very, very important. And it's very effective. Uh, uh, one uh, also very important point to mention is that when we were in South Africa recently, a few months ago, we had a very good meeting with the participation of uh, more than 41 delegations from different countries, um, from more than 40 countries. And uh, there was a decision to initiate uh, a global anti-apartheid movement, part of which could be the BDS, of course. Uh, a new global anti-apartheid movement uh, could resemble the success of the anti-apartheid movement against the South African apartheid uh, system. Uh, the biggest challenge that faces us up till now is the policy of certain Arab governments that continue the normalization with Israel, regardless of this terrible genocide and all these attacks on the Palestinian people. That's something that, in my opinion, should be addressed and raised. Uh, we know that uh, if, there, if, 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 if the people in these countries were living in a true democratic situation, this would not be the case. Uh, but we know what kind of oppression they are subjected to. Nevertheless, I think BDS represents a very important tool for the peoples of these countries to show a different approach, a different attitude, a different policy than uh, from what their governments are doing. So but we hear a lot about the um, the annexation of Israel, of, of the West Bank, the Israeli annexation of Israel, the real harsh uh, things that Palestinians, even in Area A, are going through. So 
Is there like, um, you know, because we know that a lot of this BDS movement started from within Palestinian grassroots society. So what impact, uh, what challenges do these activists face in inside the, the occupied territories and also inside the historic Palestine? Well, of course, they face a lot of challenges because Israel considers the BDS movement as anti-Semitic and uh, they almost call it a terrorist act. And uh, of course, the activists could be subjected to different kind of punishment. And we've seen many of the activists with us uh, being arrested on the so-called, under the so-called administrative detention, which means that they could be put in jail without charges even, and uh, for unlimited period of time. Uh, so this is, of course, a uh, challenging matter. But to explain what you have just said about annexation, let me explain, especially to the younger generation, what Israel is doing. Uh, not only Israel is keeping its legal occupation of West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, and not only it is keeping the ethnic cleansing of uh, more than 70% of the Palestinian population uh, since 1948, but Oslo agreement, when it was signed in 93, indicated in the two agreements that were signed, 93 and 94, that the West Bank will be divided in three categories. Area A, which was about 18%, where the Palestinian Authority will have security and civil control. Uh, security means security control, and uh, civil control means that the Palestinian Authority will be in charge of licensing, for instance, infrastructure, houses, uh, institutions, etc. Also, the agreement said that Area B will be also 18% and uh, will, where the Palestinian Authority will not have security control, but will have civil control, civil authority. And then Area C, unfortunately, which is almost 62% of the West Bank, would be under Israeli full security and civil control. Since the, uh, for the last 10 years, the Israeli government was systematically prohibiting any building for Palestinians in Area C. Uh, and, but when, since the new government came to power, which is the government of fascists, in my open opinion, like Smotrich and ben Gvir and Netanyahu, they did not allow a single house to be, uh, to be built in Area C while they allowed more than 26,000 settlement units for Israelis. So practically, this government has banned any Palestinian building in Area C, which is 62%. What Smotrich recently did as the real governor of the West Bank was to take away from the Palestinian Authority the civil control of the so-called Area B, which means that the 62% now has become uh, more than that, it's almost 80 or 82 percent of the West Bank, which is where Palestinians not only will not be allowed to have permits to build anything, but actually Israel could in, invade these areas and demolish what has been already built if they don't like it. And that's exactly what Smotrich said. We will not only be, he said they will, they will not only build illegal settlements, but also that they will demolish Palestinian structures. What remains is Area A, but Area A is already, uh, the Palestinian Authority in Area A has already lost its security control completely since months because the Israeli army invades these areas, arrests whoever they want, demolish whatever house they want, etc., etc. So in a way, what Israel is doing is shrinking anything that has remained of the Palestinian Authority authority and has made the authority an authority without authority, an authority under full Israeli military occupation. Uh, that is another, another factor while the set, why, which is encouraging settlers to push out Palestinians from the areas where they live in, especially in Area C. And up till now, more than 32 communities have been pushed out of their land by Israeli settlements, uh, by Israeli settlers' terror. They practice terror against people. They behave as terrorist gangs, and they attack Palestinian communities. I don't know if you have seen recently, just uh, the last 48 hours, there was a horrible video of uh, settlers attacking Palestinians in Masafir Yatta, in Hebron area, 
uh, under the protection and with the help of the Israeli army. So here we are facing truly another act of uh, ethnic cleansing and I would say even genocide, not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. And that, all of that is, of course, so, of course, an important factor why BDS has to be enhanced. Now, to summarize, I want to say on this issue, I want to say that Israel is declaring day and night that they have no place for Palestinian state. The most recent decision of the uh, Israeli Knesset was very clear. But the more clear thing was that both the government and opposition Zionist parties were in favor of this resolution. That sends a very clear message to the Palestinian people that Israeli Zionism is not ready for any kind of compromise with the Palestinians. It sends another very important message to every Palestinian and hopefully to the world that the Israeli settler colonial project, which started in the beginning, in the end of 19th century, is continuing. In 1948, they took over 82% of, uh, sorry, 78% of the Palestinian historic land and transformed it and Judaized it. And now they intend to complete the same process in the West Bank. And they want to reoccupy Gaza. This is the picture. And uh, that's why I think the question is, how can we respond to that? All these beliefs in Oslo agreement, Oslo process was completely wrong. And Israel used the time that Oslo gave them to build all these settlements activities. In my opinion, now as Palestinians, we have to put our idea very clear about our goal as people. It's not just ending occupation. It's not just ending apartheid. It's also about ending and stopping the whole settler colonial project. And that should be clear. How can we do that? There are only two ways. Unified Palestinian resistance on the ground in every possible way, and very powerful international boycott divestment sanctions. So I want you to understand here that BDS constitutes a major part of the future Palestinian strategy to achieve liberation and freedom. Thank you. Um, so, you know, when I'm listening to you, I can I cannot stop but think, you know, with all the things that's happening right now, it's as if we're we're at the race with with either the fascists, the settlers will take over all of. The, even the the Palestinian Authority territories, or will the international community be able to stop Israel? You know, with its uh, with its solidarity, and uh, uh, what do you see the future? Because you know, I'm going to ask all the guests about the future of this uh, later, also. But since um, we won't be able to to have you all all the way through. What do you see is the future for this movement and how do you see, practically, how do you see this, you know, building up from, from our side, from the international global side? Well, of course, if we were talking about any other country that violates international law in such a manner as Israel does, Israel is a pariah structure now. I mean, uh, everybody who understands international law understands that. I mean, what do you need more than genocide or uh, using starvation as an instrument of collective punishment or ethnic cleansing of a whole population? But the West is using double standard, and many Western governments are simply practicing hypocrisy. They keep talking about two-state solution, while in reality they are allowing Israel to kill the two-state solution. And the most dramatic uh, statement was the most recent one by the uh, State Department of the United States. When the Israeli government, uh, when the Israeli parliament, Knesset, took the decision of rejecting a Palestinian state, the spokesperson of the State Department came out saying, uh, we're not sure that this decision hurts the two-state solution. I mean, what do you need more? And then he said, we were not sure whether we should be unpleased with this resolution. This is the level of American policy. And then after the ICJ resolution, they had the guts to come out and say it's harmful. It, it hurts the possibility of peace. Give me a break. 
The United States of America is declaring that there is no place for international law. That's the reality. And many Western governments who keep talking about two-state solution without demanding the end of occupation, without demanding the removal of Israeli settlements, as the ICJ has said in its ruling, without recognizing Palestine, are simply practicing hypocrisy. And we should not listen to them. The only way to respond to this kind of double standard is actually this grassroots boycott divestment sanctions, which should increase and enhance. If it wasn't Israel and Palestine, any other country that would have done what Israel has done, it would be immediately subjected to sanctions and boycott by governments, not just by the people. But that's, that is the dilemma we are facing now. And that's why the PDS as a grassroots popular uh, civil society, community-based activity is very important at the moment. And we shouldn't be surprised that we have to rely on that now besides our resistance because that was the case with South Africa. In the beginning, in the case of South Africa, governments did not boycott South African apartheid system. On the contrary, they cooperated with it. It was the people. And then the people affected parliaments and parties. And then the parties and parliaments affected governments. And the last government to change was the United States of America. I remember being interviewed on CNN um, uh, during Obama's time, no, not before Obama's time, actually after Nelson Mandela has become the first democratically elected president of South Africa at a time when every American president was still trying to get a photo opportunity with Nelson Mandela. At that time, I spoke then at CNN and said, Nelson Mandela was still on the terrorist list of the American Congress. So don't be surprised that some governments will continue to support Israel. The question is what we can do together to undermine this thing. So what is it that we can do together? Enhance and increase PDS as wide as possible. Enhance and increase the solidarity campaign. Enhance media war. We have to conduct a media war to win the minds of the people. We have to bring the Palestinian true narrative about the reality and the situation. Not the Palestinian even narrative, the true narrative about the reality and the situation. We have to win the, the world, the minds of the people. And these changes that have happened in the United States of America with all these younger people joining the solidarity movement, with even many Jewish groups joining the solidarity with Palestine, that is very promising. But believe me, it will vanish unless it is well organized. So my message to everybody uh, from the whole experience we had before, if we want to keep this movement growing and becoming more and more effective, it must organize. The Israeli Zionist movement is very powerful, not because there are so many, not only because they are rich, they are so powerful because they are very, very, very well organized. And we cannot defeat them without being very, very, very well organized as well. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa. And um, uh, you're free to, to stay with us. Uh, we would love that. But if you feel that it is really too late for you, uh, please also uh, feel free to, to um, you know, go and rest. But we are really happy and pleased that you were able to join us even from China. Thank you. Uh, I'll stay for five minutes more and then I will go. But I'd like to listen to others a little bit. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask about, because, you know, uh, Dr. Mustafa talked about this need for international movements and international uh, war of information and the BDS to, to continue and to expand to affect its government. So... I want to ask you, uh, Muzna, about how you're in France and you have lived in France or Europe for a while now. And we have seen until now how the BDS movement was illegalized. It was illegal in certain countries or if now it's in certain European countries. It's also illegal to have the Palestinian flag. It's illegal to have the kufiya. So with this level of, you know, um, uh, kind of 
pressure and injustice towards the Palestinian cause. How do you think uh, the, the, this is developing in Europe? And how do you think it is going to be able to overcome this kind of, you know, uh, state-imposed um, restrictions towards BDS? Thank you, Mari. Um, well, actually, in France, uh, I can say that France has become like Germany. There is even, you know, we have uh, we have had uh, new parliamentarian elections, and one of the parliamentarian who is very Zionist, uh, Caroline Yadan, said, "I want everyone who uh, gets the French <clears throat> passport, the French nationality, to sign on a paper that Israel has the right to exist." So they really want to imitate Germany uh, on all fronts. Uh, censorship is very high uh, against even French journalists from originally French, not even from Arab origins. Uh, one of the uh, comedian was fired by the public radio. His name is Guillaume Maurice. Uh, another French uh, comedian was also making fun of how France is using anti-Semitism every time we say one word and she's being aggressed, attacked everywhere. It's, it's really, you know, France has become really like the, the German modern. However, uh, there are still court systems. So if we go back to 2015, France uh, wanted to convict anyone who uh, was with BDS, uh, accusing them of um, anti-Semitic and racist, inciting racism in France. But BDS, um, and going back to what Dr. Mustafa was saying about how to be organized, BDS, I think, is very organized, especially in France. Um, so they went to the European court and they got a ruling five years later in 2020 that, uh, that says that convicting BDS is a violation of a freedom of expression for France. So they couldn't go ahead and convict anyone uh, on BDS. So that was a big success. Um, there are many lawyers working with us now on many fronts. So with people who get, you know, attacked, uh, whether on social media, even kids at school uh, for accusing them of being anti-Semitic, um, controlling people's feelings. Like the question, it's not, do you condemn Hamas? How did you feel on October 7th? And if you ever dare to say, you know, I felt, wow, that was a, a big day, or at least at the beginning of the day, you know, without knowing the, the number of, of people who were killed, that's like scandalous for a French to, to hear it. So immediately they go to the police and they accuse them of apologie de terrorisme, terrorist apologies. Um, I think that um, it's, uh, it's, it's a very harsh period. The public uh, media is very... Um, Zionist, even the the, um, the uh, left wing. Uh, so what's happening now is there are lots of uh, informal channels on YouTube that are really getting lots of attention, especially by young people. So there is one called Blas, another one called Parole d'Honneur. And of course, the social media is what we see now in the street uh, tens of thousands of people going to the streets. And what's new about it is if we go back to 2014 when, when there was a, a war on Gaza, I remember when we were at the demonstrations, they were mostly Arabs, like from Morocco, Tunisia. But this time, it's really the French people wow. from universities, the young. And it's telling because it's a generational issue that really that was the young and they, they were really in the streets and they are uh, there are a group of uh, Jewish French young people who formed a new group called Tzedek and they are also with BDS. So that's really, you know, I mean, I'm very hopeful because when we see all this happening, it means that it's working. Um, but I would like to go to BDS because I think that there are some criteria that BDS has that really made it powerful. The first one is they base their decision on going to boycott or, or disinvesting uh, based on the level of complicity of an organization or a, a person that is famous. The second one is that the cross-movement interests, I think, really played a good role. So, for example, there are big alliances 
uh, with anyone who goes, you know, who works against uh, child labor. So this intersectionality work has led to uh, BDS, you know, being everywhere, actually, because it's part of justice, parts of humanity, etc. The third aspect is the media brand. So BDS um, will not spend its time, the, the activists will not spend their time on something that is not worth it. So, like, for example, we can find a company like McDonald's, who is as complicit as McDonald's, but is not as famous. So, of course, we prefer to target McDonald's because it's famous. So it's a media, you know, whatever brings uh, media appeal. And then the fourth one is the win ability. Can we really win? Is there an opportunity or not? So, of course, we cannot go against monopolies like Microsoft, for example, you know. So I think this strategy is very, very important and the, these concepts. But there is also another thing that I would like to share with you um, is that BDS has also a very important operational principles. The first one is sustainability. So if not, if you win, you need to sustain, not, not just say, okay, bravo, and that's it. So you need to make sure that it's sustained. Second is uh, how to be a gradual. So no matter how we are angry, it's very important to go through a process. And the process is really to do a very good research to make sure that we are doing the right thing, to build uh, power, to educate people. In France, like every weekend, there are uh, people just giving training on what is BDS and how to do it in your area, and it's all over France. So this is really something very powerful. Uh, and the third one is sensitivity. It means that we don't, you know, there is no one size fits all for, for example, even academic boycott. So we need to be careful how each context has its uh, particularity. So these are the things that I think are worth mentioning and um, make make ha has really made helped in the success of BDS. This is very interesting, you know, because we hear a lot about the the BDS movement, and it's you know uh, we're boycotting, and also especially on an individual level, we're very aware of what to boycott on the individual level. Like, okay, like as you mentioned, you know, famous brands like McDonald's, Starbucks, etc. But there is the other part, which is the divest and sanction. These are bigger projects, I guess, like because the divest, as we saw in the US, you know, it's it's huge investments of, let's say, universities. In the US, I found out that it's almost $500 billion worth of investment in, uh, in Zionist entities or in Israeli companies or in some, in, in some way, uh, companies that are helping the occupation. So when we find out about this huge figure and the, and we're going to be talking to the two uh, youth members here in our conversation also about this but you know when we talk about not just the small individual level boycotting of products but you know the bigger level of demanding transparency where are uh, companies schools universities are investing even retirement funds where are they re investing that's the that's the point of investment and then we have the sanction which we demand our countries to stop investing in Israel or doing business with Israeli companies so how do you think we could manage the other two, which is, I think, a bigger chunk of the money. Yeah, I think uh, there was an article about this lately in the Financial Times. I can I can send it, uh, put it as a link. Um, I think this is why the young people at uh, universities um, in the US and even in Europe after the US have started with asking for disclosure because... Actually, even the administration, it seems, they don't really have the right, you know, number. They, you know, they they would tell students we need some time. So the the, the way to calm students is wait, and you know, we're we're gonna disclose. And it's it's it seems that, you know, it's either they don't want transparency, they are lying, or they just you know um, want really time to to make you know the the um, the the research. Um, so. 
it's important uh, the students smartly asked for this without just saying, you know, out of the blue, we want you to put sanctions on Israel. But, you know, so let us know what, what where is our money going? And it's very important. So um, that's something really uh, hard to know. We really need to be in the system to understand whether they really mean it or they lie or, you know, they, they don't want to show it. But it's very definitely something that is that BDS is trying to work on. It worked a lot with um, some uh, religious groups in the States where they mm -hmm. divested from the States with also some banks, you know. Um, but the educational system is really something that we need to uh, work on, uh, especially in France. I mean, in France, you don't even talk about BDS inside universities. You don't find any university teacher who would dare to talk about BDS? They are really scared. So I think that the Anglo-Saxon word is is way ahead of the French uh, system, and that's really something very interesting. And and talking about academia, I would really I'm reading now this book that just came out, and I really encourage everybody to read it. It's uh, by Nurit Pellet uh, El Hanan about. Palestine, she did, she's an Israeli Jew, and she did um, a whole research about how Israeli school books and why it is important to boycott, because many people uh, would tell you, especially in Europe, that, come on, how can you boycott Israeli universities? Uh, people who would come for a conference, this is not helpful for the Palestinian cause, you know, they would tell you this. But um, actually, in, in her book, Nurit really showed well how there is this huge propaganda, how Israeli university system is involved directly, even in the arms, you know, uh, um, in the arms uh, of uh, in the army uh, in Israel, and how this propaganda of um, the Palestinian doesn't even exist, you know, in Israeli school books. Um, and not only in Israeli school books, in the whole educational system, but, you know, everything is anti-Palestinian ideology in Israel. And she shows it very well. And, you know, it's really from an Israeli who is saying it. So I would recommend this book because it helps a lot. Uh, this is why education is part of, of, of BDS, because it, it can help us answer some questions when we know that people, you know, would like, people wouldn't understand that we can boycott Israel, you know, especially people who relate a lot with Israel, and there are plenty in France. Um, so um, reading a lot, asking questions, looking on the internet. Uh, Omar Barghouti, the founder of BDS from Ramallah, is, is, is really also someone we need to always read. He's interviewed in, in many newspapers, not really in the mainstream media, but... Uh, you know, there is a whole page uh, website that, you know, where even people can ask any question if they need. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to come back to the, the issue of uh, educational boycott uh, in a bit, but I'd also like to ask uh, Khaled, since you've been, you know, uh, advocating for the same BDS and uh, the Justice for Palestine in the universities and on the ground. So how did you, as a movement, of course, not you individually, but how did you as, an, as a movement come to this, um, you know, tactic or strategy of actually demanding transparency and divesting, you know, universe, because personally, uh, you know, people from outside the U.S., we this was a surprise for us you know we didn't know that there's such big huge amount of money that's invested from academia in israeli zionist you know companies entities etc so how did you manage to go you know to this you know to this, to this discovery and you know this strategy of in this movement which is i i guess is really really big I and mean, it's great yeah absolutely um so our understanding of the role and place of universities in universities in the U.S. in the Zionist occupation of Palestine is that universities come at the intersection of both monetary support for the Zionist entity and ideological support. That is ideological in the way that they teach history in a very 
validating way for um, the Zionist narrative and monetary in the sense that even these small liberal arts schools, we're talking schools that have less than a thousand people, have 10 to $30 million of investments in um, these genocide complicit companies. So that's why it comes out to such a shockingly high number, as was mentioned before. Um, and yeah, it, I think, um, personally for my university, we, we stand out a bit in kind of the average spread of ideologic ideology and awareness for Palestine, um, because we're a smaller university and we've historically had Palestinian students. Um, so in what I've personally seen is there is an awareness for Palestine. Then October comes um, and suddenly it goes from, oh, I, Palestine, like I know this one Palestinian student, my, my friend was Palestinian, I met a Palestinian person once. It's this distant thing going on in a foreign country, thoughts and prayers. It goes from that to this urgent, imminent, um issue and um yeah so there's there's this idea that i i think also with especially now with awareness um that are virtually all of our universities are invested in these genocide complicit companies it becomes um part of our in in our personal moral values and our collective moral values it's that we can't stay silent about this we can't we can't let this go on we can't let our tuition dollars our own hard earned money go to these companies um but also i think that our universities are very intent on censoring us and censoring our voices exactly with what was mentioned before of, okay, we'll do it later. We'll do it next semester. I mean, I, I've actually heard that we'll do it next semester. We're going through a shift of faculty. We'll, we'll wait until the next person comes. I mean, it's really just stalling. Um, so it's a matter of setting up these very doable steps of disclose um, disclosing their investments, which did in our personal experience turn out that we had to go through this person and the next person, the next person, all the way it's, oh, I don't have access to this, but the next person does. So it does, it does take a lot of time, but we were able to set up, uh, very doable steps, um, to, to get there, um, to get to our goal. Um, in addition to, um, my school personally doesn't have, uh, ties with, currently doesn't have ties with Israeli universities, um, and doesn't have exchange programs for Israeli students. Others do. And I've actually seen excellent success, um, in, in severing those because, um, I think that students are generally the student bodies are not welcoming towards um, students that they are now aware could have, may have, probably have served in the IOF. Um, and it's, you're not welcome on our campus. Um, so it's actually not practical su to sustain those. We are creating an environment in which it is actually not practical to sustain these relationships with Israeli universities um, and with genocide complicit companies. And I think that that is a great success. Just for our viewers' information, IOF stands for Israeli Occupation Forces. Um, so, so that some people might not really know the, the term. So, so this is really, you know, Nadia, this kind of, you know, student movement, and, and you've been really involved in the Palestinian youth movement. And how have you seen the shift? I mean, like both of you have been, you know, doing this for a long time, but as, as Khaled just mentioned, October came and things changed dramatically, I guess. So 
how have this changed for you and how is it is it going in the right direction because we saw in the news how uh, you know the police came in and you know we no longer hear about the encampments at least in the international news so what's going on there now what's what's how is it developing right now i think we've seen many ebbs and flows as Khaled kind of mentioned You know, if we see 2021 and the uprisings where a lot of youth got involved, there was kind of a raising of consciousness um, of uh, not just one or two events of Israeli occupation, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, um, but actually a, a consistent timeline. And yet the movement uh, again dipped uh, in its engagement in the streets uh, after a few months. And I think we've seen this consistently my uh, kind of throughout this time of grassroots organizing, um, definitely in the U.S. and Europe. Um, October and uh, 2023 in general, I think, is really different. And so kind of what we've been able to see even through this moment, nine months into genocide, is a significant rise in the political threshold and in the threshold of consciousness of people in the United States and people across the world, honestly, um, in terms of not just their uh, solidarity with Palestine or their conviction um, that the occupation of uh, Palestine is wrong and that genocide is untenable and indefensible and should be stopped, um, but actually a growing contention with the governments, our government, that continues to support Israel Um, in every step of the way. And so much of what we've been seeing actually is a very clear rhetoric and what we've been organizing around, in fact, is a very clear rhetoric that this genocide is not just an Israeli genocide, it's also a U.S. genocide. Because without the money and the funding coming from the United States and the FMF, you know, the military funding, um, and also actually, uh, this is important because of the ICJ ruling, the constant flow of money from the United States to through 501c3 or nonprofits in order to support settlement and settler infrastructure across Jerusalem, the West Bank, and also protest, um, literally stopping aid convoys entering Gaza, um, Israel would not be able to uh, continue its onslaught. Uh, Israel itself is bankrupt. There are many Uh, articles coming out now about the end, quote unquote, of Israel's economy. So without the United States in particular, um, the occupation of Palestine and the genocide against the Palestinian people does not happen. I think that's very important because now we're also seeing, lastly, this uh, kind of contradiction that people here are really feeling. Um, and that's, I think, part of the power of the Palestinian movement is that we're able Uh, in this moment, and this is through consistent organizing around principles of collective liberation, understanding that uh, we're an anti-imperialist movement, so we're challenging the gains of empire um, around the world. We see Israel as a satellite state of U.S. policy uh, in the region, so it impacts the larger uh, Arab region as well. Um, that what's happening in Palestine and U.S.'s support for Israel is also has an effect on the quality of life and on policies at home for people in the so-called United States, where we have some of the worst uh, economic crisis, we have the largest uh, number of, of growing houseless people are elderly across the nation. We have so many uh, uh, socioeconomic issues, um, and yet we wake up every morning and we're able somehow over the past nine months to send over $14 billion dollars to uh, Israel in order to bolster its genocide when actually the majority of the people here in the United States uh, want the genocide to end. The baseline, political baseline, is a ceasefire, and that's actually been uh, agreed upon in majority since November from the numbers that we have, showing over 80% of Democratic voters supporting a ceasefire at that time, showing over 50% of Republican voters supporting a ceasefire at that time. Uh, I'll say lastly that we as Palestinian organizers, um, folks who are committed to uh, the national liberation of our homeland, know that ceasefire is the political floor. But what's really important to your question is it shows the amount of growth that we've been able to really achieve. Um, and the next step 
uh, is to be able to consolidate our gains as our community is demobilized. Because nine months into genocide, we've been organizing, we've been in the streets, we've been so loud and clear. As Muzna mentioned, this is not just a movement of Palestinians or Arabs or Muslims. It's such a broad uh, movement of people. It's truly diverse across uh, race, class, uh, generation. Um, and so what does it mean to take a next step? Um, and so that's what we have to move towards uh, as organizers is trying to direct that vision from mobilizing into organizing. Um, and that's really why um, the Palestinian move, youth movement um, picked up a, a divestment campaign uh, called the Mask Off Mask campaign, which I'm happy to talk more about. But it's trying to answer this question of um, moving uh, and continuing to grow um, this moment, this conviction, this power of, of the people across campuses uh, and cities in labor in order to really uh, push um, and, and make sure that, you know, Israel uh, committing a genocide uh, over the last 10 months, one, uh, this genocide has not stopped, it's continuing, do, is not left unanswered. There isn't just silence at the end of such an enormous sacrifice, but instead we have what Israel uh, fears the most, which is a free Palestine and a return of all refugees. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, going to this point of uh, this movement encompassing all ethnicities, all age groups, and especially in the U.S. now, we have a huge number of even Jewish Americans taking part in this movement. And I saw a shocking um, survey result actually la end of last year. I think it was November in on the CNN. Uh, for the first time uh, in the age group of um, 18 to 24 or 26, there are more than 80% of the Jewish people are not supporting Israel anymore. This is, I was shocked, you know, okay, you have the exact opposite number for the age group of above 60, where 80% of the Jewish community support Israel, but you have the exact opposite for the younger generation. So that was a really pleasant surprise, let me say, uh, to, to know that there are so many Jewish people who are now standing up for their Jewishness, Jewishness, actually. It's not about, you know, it, it, being Jewish means equal being pro-Israel. Being Jewish means you have your own values, etc. Et so to talk about this, you know, there is a lot of criticism, as also Muzna mentioned a little bit earlier, about the BDS being an anti-Semitic movement. So and of course, we all know that this this is such a, a silly accusations. But now having so many Jewish people being part of this movement and kind of empowering this movement and rebutting the fact that this is a, a, an anti-Semitic movement. So uh, I want to get back to you, Khaled, you know, and since you have a mixed race uh, and, and you might be more the best person to talk about this, you know, how has the Jewish community become more vocal and more awakened about the non-Jewishness of the Zionist movement and what Israel is doing right now. All right. I love talking about this. Um, so I've seen since October, I've seen changes that honestly, I did not think that I would see within my lifetime. Um, there are ideological shifts within the Jewish community, especially within my generation that are just such a split from what I what I grew up with. Um it is uh basically the main the main thing that I've seen, I I believe that this is relatively recent, is uh Zionism and Zionist organ uh rather advertising the ideology as a liberatory ideology, as an ideology aligned with indigenous liberation um so really co-opting the language that um organizations like the american indian movement used in the united states 
in the 60s and 70s um and saying that um zionism is for uh jewish liberation and jewish safety which is bonkers that's that's crazy that's not right um and i feel like it was really being picked up and also it was very enforced that being Jewish and being Zionist are not only the same thing, but you can't be Jewish without being Zionism. That Judaism belongs to a nation. Judaism specifically belongs to the land of Palestine, which is also completely incorrect. Um, I think that the my generation was already heavily influenced, especially in the U.S., we were heavily influenced by the um, George Floyd uprising in 2020. Um, I really see that as a prerequisite, um, precursor to um, what we're seeing now, uh, four years later. Um, It was the fact that we were, uh, we saw this great injustice and then we lived through curfew, through extreme police violence. A lot of us participated in the protests. We were up against police um, shooting tear gas and flashbangs at us. And then there is much more increased awareness that these same weapons are being sent to the um, Israeli occupation forces and that these police are training the Israeli occupation forces and vice versa, the Israeli occupation forces train the police in these strategies. So it it really makes it a lot more real for anyone who thought that this was something far away. This, the other ideological shift though, that I really um, applaud uh, Jewish organizers, Jewish anti-Zionist organizers for um, like helping enforce this is that it's, I think that it's not really like it's not cool to be Zionist anymore, basically. I think especially um in the in the 90s, I think in the environment that was created um after shortly after the Oslo Accords, um it being a Zionist is it's just part of your part of your Jude- Judaism, part of your Jewish it is it means safety. Now it It does not. It is synonymous with genocide. It is synonymous with the images of children in Gaza, of dying children in Gaza, and the annihilation of the Palestinian people. Um, You are just not able to be Zionist without facing ostracization and rejection, especially in progressive communities, which the which Gen Z um, is an overwhelming um part of um so it's actually impossible to maintain that um and i think that it is a, it's an incredible victory that um the uh zionist movement has been losing the entirety of gen z but especially the gen z jewish demographic um because you can't be zionist anymore basically. Which is actually a really um, sobering and and amazing for all of us to see, because now we kind of see that we're all, we're all seeing the same thing in, in Gaza. We're not looking at split screens that, you know, because up until now, we kind of felt that the world was seeing a split screen. Some people were seeing one side of the screen and other people were seeing a completely different screen. And we were arguing upon no basis of commonality. But now I think, you know, with social media and everything, and like it's it, we cannot unsee what we are seeing on social media anymore. And going back since, uh, Muzna, you're also a media specialist uh, and um Again, you're also in Europe. Um, I would like to come uh, uh, back to the academic boycott um, and how also uh, is the media, is it doing 
the BDS and the the movement, you know, in solidarity movement justice, or is it still kind of, you know, um, spinning, you know, all sorts of ways, the, the information, is it manipulating the inf information, is it displaying it in a very biased way still? So how do you, you know, perceive all this right now? And of course, how do you see, because, you know, academic boycott is the most sensitive, I think, from from where I see it. It's, you know, boycotting a product is like, okay, once we're we're understanding what these products are involved in, we are okay with it. Or boycotting investment, we're okay with it. But then when we go to boycotting, you know, academia or, or you know, academics, Then we have a very, you know, different opinion about no, but these are these could be people who are also against the occupation, or you know, this is not uh, fair for academics because they have an opinion, etc. So, how do you tackle this, and and do you see media doing it justice? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, the mainstream media here is super, super Zionist. Um, I almost don't want to read the newspapers to watch the news because you really get angry, uh, especially when you know what's happening there and then when they, how they, you know, frame it, uh, sometimes worse than Haaretz, you know, it's unbelievable. Um, and I think the, the, there is this special relationship uh, between Israel and France that is not like, you know, with the U.S., is that France feels that they are, you know, to blame for what happened during the Holocaust, just like Germany, because of the Vichy government. So the, the media, the education system, I mean, we, we have lots of stories about kids being kicked out of schools, like Lebanese or Palestinian kids, just because, you know, they dared to say something or they were, you know, they, they saw them uh, look at a um, telegram uh, that shares Hamas uh, um, uh, videos. Um, so if you watch a Hamas video, which is in Le Monde, you know, it's not even, it's Le Monde that put it as a link. So it's like you are with terrorists, you are, and you can be, it's just a, a very, very bad um, ambiance in, in, in France. Um However, there are people who try, who, who, and even before 7th of October, there are people who keep sending letters, um, talking. But the, the issue here is the whole system. It's the media that is very Macronist. So whatever Macron says or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, like, for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs lately said uh, about the, the latest Gaza massacre that we are concerned You know, and they say it on their Twitter uh, X account. But when when Yemen attacked Tel Aviv, they said we were shocked by the attack. So I mean, you know, it's you 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 feel that France is Israel. You know, you don't even need to say France is supporting Israel. For me, it's you know, it's Israel. Um, and people are really afraid. So there is this imagine in the you know the 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 country, the state of human rights. People are terrified. Even on the phone, they would you know say, okay, I'll I'll tell you later, or you know. So it's it's really exactly like Palestinians of 48 that live you know inside Palestine 48. How the Israelis are treating them. This is exactly the same way. Uh, I have friends you know from Lebanese and Tunisian origins who work together, and they would. You You know, just, you know, talk in another language just for others not to take it even, you know, they don't say anything. It's just that people would, would take it so aggressively and without even you noticing. So now we we we, we have been really trying to be careful without uh, before saying a word. This is why I say it's very similar to, to Germany. Uh, but people are not hearing this a lot. So now, for example, it's not only education, it's also uh, sports, you know. So we have the Olympic Games uh, coming next week and the Russian team have no right to uh, raise their flags. They have no right to uh, even have their uh, national hymn, but the Israelis do. And so BDS and the other activists, you know, are part of this uh, movement that is saying, you know, why, just like what Dr. Mustafa said, this hypocrisy. I think saying hypocrisy is a very nice word. I would say it's really racism because it ha it's open racism now. Uh, we've seen it. Um, however, the shift that Khaled spoke about very well, I think I also feel it with the young generation. And um, I think these people are more knowledgeable than the uh, than their parents and grandparents 
And I think they felt, um, it's like, you know, they felt that the government is lying, you know, that it's not only about Palestine, because if it's about only Palestine, then anything else they say, they don't believe them. So, you know, there is, I think it's a very, very interesting period that some people even um, sometimes call it, looks like May 68, you know, when the whole uh, <laughs> Parisians were in the streets, you know, against uh, all the system. So I think it's coming. I'm, I'm very hopeful about the future, to be honest. I know it's very hard time. I know it's a lot of blood that will be, uh, you know, spilling. But I think uh, the ICJ resolution, um, I mean, especially the one that started in 24. Uh, this is the one where, you know, uh, BDS, um, you know, started strong. Now BDS is already strong all over the world. So I think with this new uh, ICJ opinion, advisory opinion, I think BDS will be amplified, uh, will be, you know, working with other um, um, community groups on other issues. I mean, everybody is with BDS, climate change people, um, you know, people uh, against violence, women violence, etc. I mean, because, you know, at the end of the day, if you are with Palestine, it means that you are with the rights of, you know, any uh, part of any community. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. And I think that Israel is 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 losing, and and like Ilan Pape is saying, Israel is it's the end, it's the beginning of the end of Israel. Um, and if you realize, I mean, after October seventh, uh, people don't talk about two state solution, or now they go to the root cause of the issue, and and this is very interesting because nobody is really just you know Israel. These are the leaders who talk about two state solution, and you know, and we know that they don't even mean it. Now people are really, you know, reading into the root cause of this whole uh, question of Palestine. And we've seen it in France in many, even cultural events, where there were there was something about Palestine before October 7th, and it was supposed to end uh, in November. They had to, you know, uh, make it longer because there were so many people. It's Institut du Monde Arabe, for example. And it's all young people coming. They want to read. They want to know. They want to. So it's like, like uh, you know, uh, everyone wants to be educated about Palestine. And this is very, very promising. And it's time, actually, because it's been 100 years. It's really, indeed, a high time that things change. Um, and going back to the impact, you know, Nadia, if we see all these changes that are happening now, even on the way the students are demanding the the, the transparency of the, the university's divestment, um, you know, countries like Japan also, they have forced uh, companies like Ito to, to stop their cooperation with Elbit uh, uh, systems. What are the, you know, the actual economic um, impact of BDS as you know it, it if, from what you know, Nadia? Yeah, it's massive. I think, uh, you know, when I say movement, I mean our movement with all of its strategies and all of its tactics. I know that BDS, um, it's been said on this panel, right? There are multiple prongs to this. BDS is really central because it's something that everyone can participate in. Um, we have many different campaigns that are focusing on each. And you kind of mentioned, my that perhaps divestment and sanctions are two areas of BDS that we haven't explored as much. Um, and I think really now is the time to move um, into, uh, you know, just to question, okay, what does it look like to actually um, scale up our ability to boycott? Um, from just uh, products to um, something bigger. I think with divestment, also um, thinking about uh, some of the divestment calls for Hewlett Packard against Hewlett Packard in 2012, for example, in different face spaces, which uh, was actually directly um, uh, implicit in kind of uh, mobilizing the Christian faith space in particular, um, to divest from Hewlett Packard because of its engagement and complicity in. Um, the uh, imprisonment of uh, children, of Palestinian children in the Israeli military detention uh, system. And so 
for us, uh, what's the impact? Part of the impact is uh, economic, as you mentioned, and I think that's um, a big part of it. We know that these numbers are higher than we've ever seen before, um, but the other really is narrative and being able to shatter the very carefully um, curated image that Israel has put forward of being uh, a democratic Western state um, in the Middle East. Um, this uh, Their genocide um, against the Palestinian people has effectively shattered that for them. But it's important for us to also continue to really um, show the ways in which the rest of the world is complicit and has created this double standard and uh, diplomatic cover, political cover, media cover, so that Israel can continue its genocide um, without facing any repercussions. And that's really where um, BDS uh, comes in. And so I think um, in terms of the impact, for example, if we think about the Mask Off Maersk campaign, Maersk is a Danish logistics company. It's one of the leaders in the industry. It's one of the largest logistics companies in the world. And they are also um, shipping in mass. Or, and actually, it's beyond boats. It's uh, trains. It's trucks. It's airplanes. It's uh, boats. They're bringing weapons to Israel from the United States and Europe. And so what we thought about in this moment was a leveling up in order to match the awareness of our people and the responsibility to the Palestinian people um, in order to be able to confront one of the major issues or one of the main um, uh, pillars of genocide, which is weapons. We know that without weaponry, without military, and without economic support, uh, this genocide would not happen. And so how do we as a people actually enact a people's arms embargo? Because we've been saying in huge numbers, unprecedented, right? In D.C. in November, we had over 800,000 people in the street. And we're a grassroots organizing coalition. We were able to pull the people because the people themselves felt that and they're committed to it. So how do we actually deal with the fact that we've been demanding since November a ceasefire. We've been demanding for these weapons and this money to stop, but nothing has happened. We take up the question utilizing BDS as a tactic and as a strategy to say, okay, if these companies will not stop the flow of weapons, we will. If our government will not stop sending money for weapons to Israel, then we will stop it. And we will stop it through being an international movement that is cut across many highways, many cities, many universities, many ports, and many places around the world. And we will come together in order to stop Maersk, who is active in every single one of these locations because they are one of the largest logistics companies in the world. And we will stop them from actually being able to continue business as usual. And so this is moving from just beyond a platform of divestment as we've seen it before. Inshallah, what it offers is really an opportunity for us as an international movement to use our power and use our benefit of being everywhere in order to stop the flow of weapons to Israel everywhere. Um, and so uh, just lastly, we know that Maersk, because it's such a large company, is shipping weapons to Israel is not the only thing that it does. So that's important because corporations care very much about their bottom line. And so it means that they are going, they are very, they're able to divest from 14% of their company uh, activity, which is weapons to Israel. Um, they're able to actually divest from that and they can still continue and keep profits from the rest of their portfolio. And we actually were very inspired by Ito and what happened in Japan, because we think that as more uh, countries around the world are faced with things like this ICJ ruling, they will have to actually take a stand that is uh, divesting and, and removing their support 
for Israel's occupation of Palestine and for all the things that continue, the building of settlements, apartheid, the imprisoning and torture of our people en masse. Over 10,000 Palestinians have been imprisoned and are imprisoned currently. Um, the conditions are worse than ever before. So as that happens, the United States, Britain, France, Germany, whoever remains will become a smaller and smaller portion of the international community. And so when Japan takes that stand, hopefully when Denmark takes that stand where Maersk is based and says, you as a company cannot continue to engage in f on and direct support and profiteering off of genocide using this country as a base, it will actually, yes, uh, in, in, you know, in, increasingly make it economically costly to do business with Israel, but also it will um, impede uh, and kind of shatter Israel's protection through its diplomatic ties, its political ties, its economic ties, and its protection around um, narrative. Um, that is shattering. The world is changing. People are waking up, and there is something that we can do about this. And uh, even if our governments and the corporations around us who are fueling this genocide have refused to do so, we as a people can. Um, and that's what this next uh, uh, time for divestment, for boycott, for sanctions is about. It's about raising that threshold. Um, you know, all you know when you, when people probably who are still not involved in this movement or in this action you know this urgent action would probably feel that you know these you know th things or these thoughts are very big for me as an individual what can i do as an individual as a person you know it's i'm too weak um you know i'm only a person so how can i challenge all these huge companies governments uh, you know uh, conglomerates all these investments how can i as a person individual have the power to to create that change so as um you know um you feel that this is um impossible for some people might feel it's impossible what would be your as an ending remark what would be your uh you know answer to that kind of thinking that kind of mindset how would you convince the person who has that kind of mindset let's ask you Khalid first so I would um emphasize what uh Dr Mustafa said about um the basically ideological boycotts um and that on the sentiment that we are not outnumbered by any means in fact we make up our opinion makes up the global majority what we stand for majority of the world believes in we are simply out organized so strengthening our numbers um i think especially as um the U.S. and other uh, Western countries are entering more conservative uh, eras, more conservative governments with stronger, um, with a stronger emphasis on imperialism and support for the Zionist state. We are going to see an increase in the punishment and reprimanding of activists and people who sympathize with the Palestinian cause. That's going to be suspension from colleges or expulsion. I think we saw the first um, expulsion relatively recently. We're going to see um, people getting fired from work that we're going to see people getting censored. It's something that's already happening. Um, but I can definitely foresee that this is something that's going to increase. So um, I encourage everyone to keep um, not only spreading information on social media and talking about Gaza personally, but also um, forming unions in your workplaces and, um, and also telling people to form unions um, of students uh, so that when there's any repercussions and punishment 
that people are able to stand up as a force for the people getting reprimanded and basically make it so that it is impossible to ignore, not only impossible to ignore Palestine, but impossible to silence the work for Palestine everywhere. Make a world in which you can't go anywhere without seeing the rejection of Zionism and the support for a free Palestine. Thank you. That's a great ending remark, Khaled. Nadia? We are continuing to organize, uh, and we know that it's really important to actually uh, not fall into the question of what can we do, but instead, what am I doing? Um, we have to have politics of can. We are actually able to change something. Look how much we've been able to do. No, we have not been able to stop a genocide, but we have been able to change the conditions in which Israel operates. And it is a different world now than it was nine months ago. Um, so with that spirit, we're continuing to confront, as Khaled said, Zionism and our own uh, so-called representatives, wherever they are. And one of those examples is coming up July 24th, as Netanyahu is visiting D.C. We know there's been many stories or, I, you know, murmurs, is he canceling, is he not? We think that it's very unlikely that he will cancel. And so we're continuing forward. Our uh, government and its representatives have invited a war criminal in the middle of a genocide to come to the United States in order to speak before this body. And we are going to challenge him. We will not let any representative of the Zionist entity, particularly its prime minister, rest in this moment. And again, it's that double standard. If our governments will not set that line, then we will as a people. And that's something we will continue to do. We will continue to confront our representatives and we will not be placated by different promises or narratives around what could be possible. We know that the time to act is now, um, and we uh, will continue to keep that pressure because we have a vision for the future, and it's one of um, freedom for the Palestinian people um, and a free Palestine, freedom for all political prisoners, and the right to self-determination and return for all refugees, which, as you know, Mai, has been the same demands that we have kept uh, for over the past uh, let's say 60, 70 years. And so those are not things that we can barter or sell. Those are our responsibilities. And we carry ourselves forward and lead um, all of us, yani, a larger solidarity movement into uh, the future using those demands that cannot be swayed. Um, we know that the end of the Israeli occupation and Zionist entity as we know it is near. And so it's important to really take action and to remind all of us to take action in this moment. These are historic times and what happens from them is what we are able to create together. Thank you. That's also a very nice, great remark and encouragement for everyone who's listening. Um, thank you very much, uh, Khaled. Thank you very much, Nadia. And thanks to Muzna and uh, Dr. Mustafa, who have not, who are not joining, who are not with us right now. But thank you so much for your insights, your experience, and your time. And thank you, everyone, for being part of this conversation. As a, f a finishing remark, let me read this, um, and then I will uh, move to uh, closing remark. Uh, sorry, to handing this uh, session to Sahar and Andrew. South Africa was once a nation trapped by apartheid's cruel whip, but change brewed not only from within its borders, it was the hearts of people across the ocean, across continents. Ordinary citizens became torchbearers, igniting a global movement, an orchestra of boycotts, divestment, and unwavering solidarity. Today, as we discuss the boycott, divestment, sanction, BDS movement, let us remember that our action ripple far beyond borders. Just as the world rallied for South Africa, so too do we rally for Palestine. Our voices, our choices, they matter. Drawing from the uh, strength of Mandela's words, it always seems impossible until it's done. So let us make the impossible possible, brick by brick, heart by heart. Thank you for being part of this conversation. And thank you for Sahar uh, and uh, Andrea Asaf 
and Sahar Asa for organizing this event. Thanks for all the people behind the scene in uh, global th uh, thread production, art to art action, and all the other theaters that were producing and taking part in this long marathon event. Thank you. And this is the final session that will be um, uh, followed by a session. And I'm handing in the room for Sahar and Andrea. I would like to hand the live stream back to her and both of uh, Sahar and Andrea. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, oh, sorry, one more thing. I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning. So my name is Mei Shigenobu. I am a journalist, a researcher, a producer, and an author. Thank you. And I'm also Japanese-Palestinian, just so that people know. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for curating and uh, moderating.